In many places around the world, security professionals congregate in conventions where governments and corporations can see the latest in spy equipment. Some call these the spy bazaars. Sales of surveillance technology is booming, and in most cases, this market is unrestricted by the West. So tyrannical governments can choose to obtain the latest tech to surveil their population or perhaps purchase the latest spyware so they can track their opposition all around the world. What I will do today is give you a glimpse of what is available both to governments and private parties. I'm sure I will not have a complete list here since I have no inside information. But what I know is enough to keep you on your toes. It is safe to say the capabilities available today are incredibly invasive and scary to say the least. If you want to learn about spy technologies, stay right there. Times have changed. Within the last decade, much of the technologies for surveillance have focused on the mobile phone. The most interesting tool, of course, to any phone owner is the possibility of wiretapping. This is the ability to overhear your phone conversations. Of course, the reality is that very little phone traffic is actually voiced now. Much of our conversations are in digital data form like texting or through the use of some app. So we can generalize the wiretapping problem to include someone actually hacking your phone and using the most scary hack of all, which is a remote access Trojan. Remote access allows an external party to directly control your phone as if they were physically next to the phone. This is actually even legit software. Apps like LogMeIn can be installed and were installed in many phones. In the past, even T-Mobile used it on their Androids to do tech support, which really enabled someone to control a customer's phone. Crazy. There are many app makers making remote control software, and if you willingly install it from an app store, then you've just enabled a remote access Trojan or RAT. A cybersecurity research group found that the baseband modem SIM card has built-in instructions that can be executed remotely. This was called the SIM jacker and likely a government-initiated program. This allowed an external party that has access through the phone carrier to remote control the phone. So phone calls could be initiated. SMS texts could be seen and sent. Just an example of what could be done. The phone could silently dial out, and of course, when it does that, the microphone turns on. Phones are chock full of surveillance tech. The GPS Wi-Fi module is responsible for tracking locations, and every regular phone reports into the OS 24-7 with updated locations. This tech powers things like AirTag location, Find My Phone, Government Geofencing, and so on. The phones have a gyro sensor which can sense changes in position and space. This can actually track movement in a precise way, including orientation. Used mostly for gaming and UI, it can also gauge your actual physical position. iPhones form a grid of communications peer-to-peer -peer outside of the internet. This is called the Apple Mesh Network and is powered by Bluetooth. There is also an equivalent mesh network with Amazon, which is called the Amazon Sidewalk. These technologies allow low energy equipment to talk to each other over long distances. This allows surveillance equipment to send data to HQ using just a battery. The most common consumer device using this mesh is the AirTag. However, other devices, including secret devices, can piggyback on this mesh network as well. When we think of surveillance, we think of the tech-filled vans with no windows. Here are a couple of photos of actual surveillance vans. They're pretty nondescript. But if you suspect a surveillance van, approach it and listen for sounds. And if there are any sounds like AC or a generator, you should be very suspicious. Take photos, including the license plate. Surveil them for a change. But the interesting thing nowadays is that most surveillance can be done remotely through the internet, through data you already reveal yourself with your phones and computers. For example, in the old days, wiretapping involves someone posing as a telephone company repair person, climbing up the pole and putting in some listening device to your wired telephone. Well, hardly anyone uses landlines anymore, so that's definitely an out-of-date concept. But this wiretapping concept transitioned into the device called Stingray 
or an MZ catcher. This device can be used to basically fake a cell tower and then cause your phone to connect to it instead of an actual tower. Thus, this creates a man in the middle. It is quite common now for governments to use Stingray. When used, it can actually capture the identity of phones in the area. Phones broadcast an identifier called IMSI, I-M-S-I, and in passive mode, a Stingray can recall all IMSIs within receiving distance. For example, in a demonstration, someone can put a van nearby with a Stingray and capture IMSI data. Or someone could walk with a portable Stingray and strap it on their bodies. Or fly a helicopter, plane, or drone in the area and capture IMSI information down below. As much as this is still used in certain cases, in reality, there are now alternative technologies that can be used that require less resources. For example, the phone's location is stored in the Google Sensor Vault, so governments simply subpoena the information from Google of phones found within a geographical area during a particular time period. This technique was used, for example, to charge around 1,000 people in the January 6 riots in the capital all based on phone locations. Law enforcement does not need to use Stingray if they know the person's phone number. All they need to do is access the account via the Kalia system and they can read text, listen in to conversation, track phone traffic. Basically all by point and click browser interface. Stingray is useful only when the people being tracked are unknown. Now something interesting with phones. Phones also broadcast a signal for near access called a MAC address. This is broadcasted by both the Bluetooth and the Wi-Fi feature. A MAC address is a unique identifier. This means that a listening device can actually record MAC addresses of phones nearby and when cross-matched against other data like a camera can identify people. Buildings can have equipment that can track the movements of someone with a phone using this capability. Facebook actually used this feature to track users and their proximity to other Facebook users in public places. For example, anyone near a wireless network at Walmart could be tracked as being near specific Facebook users. Now let's go back to the surveillance van for a moment. The surveillance van could of course have a Stingray and have access to Kalia systems. But there are other technologies available that can be hidden in a surveillance platform. For example, a surveillance team could point a laser at a glass window of a house and listen in. The laser reflection is so precise that it can measure minute vibrations in the glass from sounds. Nowadays, with miniaturization, devices can get awfully small for communications. And with access to a mesh network, doesn't even require that close of a presence. One possibility is a remote microphone possibly flown in like an insect. Development projects of this type were around even a decade ago. Who knows where it's at now? Another tech is to have an unpowered microphone. Let's say you have some means of a flying delivery method like a miniature insect. This could stick itself on a ceiling corner. Then using a technology for RFID, a directed beam of RF can be pointed to the RFID and then it will reflect back data including sound. I've seen a test of this at a hacking convention using just homegrown parts. There's research now that show how Wi-Fi RF can be measured and can actually detect actual movements inside a house. This just requires a receiver and nothing invasive has to even enter the house. This is something of a spy scale, but it's been known for a while that the RF emitted by a computer display screen can be captured and then it can be used to recreate the content of the screen. Basically, a remote access Trojan without even any physical contact or phone hack. This requires pretty close distances though since the RF is very low. Usually this is a next room kind of attack. Now I mentioned RFID but this can be another way of tracking if someone is nearby based on RFID emissions. If your RFID reader sends out a powerful enough pulse, the RFID signals can project a further distance than the usual 1 to 3 meter range. RFID readers are often low power devices because of FCC regulations. But obviously, spy devices will ignore FCC limitations. Now, this is interesting because most of us have RFIDs around us that could identify us. For example, your car tires and your passports have RFID, and this can be recorded to track proximity. 
Of course, the best surveillance for proximity is to have a camera. Nowadays, we are surrounded by cameras everywhere. Your freeways are filled with cameras. Some are focused on doing license plate recognition. Some are doing facial recognition. For example, in our Los Angeles neighborhoods, you can get a traffic ticket based on facial recognition alone. I've actually seen them. The photos are so sharp that they can match to the driver's license photos database very accurately. Now, this unfortunately isn't such private data. Photos and license plate information captured in various locations are actually sent to private companies for handling. Companies like Palantir have contracts to collect this information and use it for further individual surveillance. For example, it was used in Los Angeles to track potential gang members. The company Clearview is another company that contracts with government to provide facial recognition services and it is sourced from a collection of public photo databases. One of the companies involved heavily in facial recognition is Amazon. In fact, their facial recognition AI is used by government. But what powers the AI surprisingly is data from things like ring cameras. Every home with a ring camera is an actual facial recognition spy. And disturbing as heck is that even every Amazon van is equipped with a ring camera that is also capturing data from its environment. Another spy tech that was revealed in WikiLeaks is that three-letter agencies were able to reverse the logic in a smart TV to turn the TV speaker into a microphone. The particular TV mentioned at the time was Samsung. But in general, beware of this. Any internet-connected device that has a speaker and no apparent microphone could be tricked by pre-programming to turn the speaker into a microphone. Of course, many of you have devices with speakers and microphones that are active spy devices but are ignored. These, of course, are the Alexa Echo devices. If you still have these, then be aware that this enables Amazon to listen to the world. Amazon, of course, is one of the largest government contractors, so it shouldn't surprise you if this technology is lent for use by the intelligence community. Here's an interesting detail about voice that many of you may not know about. These same three-letter agencies have an unbelievable voice print capability. Basically, they're able to identify hearing of someone's unique voice anywhere in the world in just a few moments. So if your voice is able to be heard through some electronic means, then it can be voice printed. This can get even more sophisticated if the voice is matched to other data like facial recognition and device IDs. Another interesting surveillance use of sound is ultrasound. Ultrasound cannot be heard by the human ear. However, it is definitely within the range of normal electronic devices to detect. So let's say specific locations have an ultrasound beacon transmitting location data. Then if you happen to be having a phone conversation, then that ultrasound beacon can be heard and could transmit your location. This could be used in some terrorist thriller movie. The police drop transmitting ultrasound beacons in an area and then the location of the perp is determined based on hearing the beacon. Or maybe they already exist. And the perp is completely unaware this was done. Now, here's another tracking method again if the people being tracked are unknown. The three-letter agencies have developed a smart dust. Basically, these are dust-sized microprocessors and they can be stuck to people invisibly and their movements can be tracked. I don't know the actual mechanism involved with smart dust. I don't know if it's similar to RFID, in which case a particular frequency has to be broadcast for the dust to ping. But the interesting thing is that the dust, like RFID, would be unpowered. Speaking of power, the limiting factor in surveillance technology for a long term is power. Using mesh networks to communicate under low power can allow small devices to run just using your typical CR80 battery. But solar power devices with lithium batteries are also low energy and could in theory allow long term surveillance. The use of solar is obviously very common now. Even now, the tracking devices are so cheap and available to the common man. One of the easiest to deploy is the Apple AirTag. You will see many uses of this now where surveillance tech can be done by anyone. Many already surveil their spouses and kids using the AirTag. Very common. 
it is actually pretty easy to build a location tracking device using even a Raspberry Pi and just Wi-Fi triangulation. I've seen these types of projects on the internet. One was even from the provider of location services itself. Or you could just even go low tech and put an old phone in a car and connect it remotely and, and track where it is. With everyday technology, even hobbyists can turn into serious surveillance experts. Now, collecting surveillance data is one thing, but putting it in massive intelligence databases with AI is another issue. This puts the surveillance at another level. One of the little known secrets to the average person is the mass surveillance of all internet communications. As discovered by some journalists, the mass surveillance for a three-letter agency is actually handled at AT&T peering stations. A peering station is where the aggregate of local internet traffic is pushed to and then it gets transported to different parts of the globe. The point of a peering station is to not duplicate the technology for routing internet traffic so ISPs just contract with each other to handle the different legs of transporting data. Except that because AT&T was so big it transported pretty much most of the internet traffic of the world, meaning it became a centralized area that can capture most of the data. For this reason, a three-letter agency put screening hardware on the traffic with keyword searches as well as IP address tracking to discover the source and destination. Then this data gets forwarded to the huge database in Utah for safekeeping. You can imagine that pretty much every email you've ever sent and received in your life should be available for posterity. The problem is that the peering station technology has been eclipsed by the surveillance technology of big tech itself. Everything you do on the internet is recorded and known by Google, for example, and tracked with a Google ID unless you watch my last video on how to evade that. Apple has the technology to automatically search content on millions of phones in an instant using AI-based client-side content scanning. Tyrannical countries had the technology to break TLS encryption, which is what powers HTTPS. They do this by using fake RSA root certificates. This was a big part of what the old Symantec was doing until Google called them out and banned their root certificates. However, this is still possible by forcing the installation of fake root certificates directly on machines. Many of you have heard of the NSO Group's spyware Pegasus. This is an example of tech powered by zero days, meaning hacks that have not been made public. Saudi Arabia had been known to have purchased this tech to spy on iPhones. Okay, the last I will mention is probably the scariest surveillance tech. There are devices now that can surreptitiously capture your DNA. And of course, millions of you have already provided your DNA to 23andMe and Ancestry.com. Someone is doing research to see if they can reconstruct your face from your DNA. This would be another level of recognition that would be incredible. It could also be used for racial profiling. In China, they were using this tech to identify a Muslim minority automatically using AI and to impose rules on this population. Basically, it should be understood that once you collect surveillance data on a population with an AI to understand each person individually, then the AI can then be used to implement goals of the state. This is the level that we are moving to, so watch out. Folks, my company creates products that are intended to protect our privacy. We provide phones that have no centralized control and are invisible to big tech. We have various de Google phones in our store. These devices use an open source AOSB and have no Google on them and no Google ID so they are invisible to Google. Check out our store for various models. We have a VPN service, Bytes VPN, which is a stealth VPN in that it doesn't scream that you are on a VPN. We do not put thousands of you on a single server. We have Braxmail, which eliminates the metadata from your emails. This means no IP addresses and traces on your email that show where it came from. We give you five domains you can partition your activities. All these products are on the store on my app Braxme. Sign up on there. You will not be asked to give any personal information to sign up. Thank you for watching and see you again soon.